Good morning and welcome to the Morning Scoop for Friday, October 16th. This is your Daily Buckeye Fix. I'm Tom Moore. The first football Saturday of the Big Ten season, eight days away. The first Big Ten game is one week from tonight, Illinois and Wisconsin. And the game against Michigan, 57 days off. This weekend's big game is number three, Georgia, at number two, Alabama. And the big story there is Nick Saban's positive COVID test. I wanted to give you a quick update on this since it wasn't clear when we talked about this on yesterday's show. But according to NCAA rules, he cannot coach from home. Communication to the field can only come from the press box starting 90 minutes before the game. So it is, you know, the the, uh, plan B there, which was, you know, maybe they can stick him somewhere in some uh, desolate corner of the stadium. Doesn't sound like that will work either. So... Uh, my guest today is Brett Siancia from Pick 6 Previews. And Brett, after the news of that positive test for Saban came out, that line moved like three points towards Georgia in a matter of like an hour or two. So to you, how much does Saban's potential absence impact this weekend's big game? Yeah, Tom, uh, th- first off, thanks for having me back on. Uh, last time we talked, it was kind of hectic in August there when it was, you know, canceled, not canceled, postponed, not postponed, uh, that, that whole mess. But uh, it's great to be back and, and having those countdown clocks going where we're a week away. And uh, it'll be great to have the Big Ten back. But, um, yeah, with uh, with Alabama and Georgia, um, it's it's – Tough news there for for Coach Saban and the Alabama program. Uh, you hope that it hadn't spread further, and I, I know they're testing pretty well, so they would have caught it by now. But uh, just awful news there. Um, you know, as it pertains to the actual football game, yeah, that's that's going to be tough because when you look across the landscape of college football head coaches, there are some that are more what you call CEOs, where uh, they delegate a lot of their responsibilities down to their coordinators, and then you have some of the control freaks who are, you know, in a good way, who are, you know, watching every single thing. They they're calling plays, they are making in-game decisions, and Saban's in that bunch. He's, uh, you know, he has his hands on every part of the program. Um, the only place he really delegates a lot would be the office offense down to um, Sarkeesian, but uh, even some key moments like two-point conversions or some, uh, you know, punting situations or onside kick surprises, that kind of stuff, that's all saving. So uh, you miss out on that. You miss out on his defensive acumen. Um, and also just his motivation on the sideline. I know you've seen the interactions when players come off the field um, after a good play, after a bad play, whatever. He's always there motivating, uh, if you want to call it motivating. I mean, some you know some harsh discipline, but I think the players really motivate towards that and play better with him there, kind of um, – you know, kind of like the teachers watching you. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a massive loss, X's and O's wise, motivation wise. Um, it'll be a distraction, definitely, uh, for Alabama. And, um, yeah, I think in terms of a betting line, if you want to look at it that way, I think that it makes sense that the line shifted that way that quickly um, because, I mean, that's almost like losing your starting quarterback in, in terms of a Vegas spread. So, um, yeah, just crazy news. And, um, you know, uh, it, we can highlight the one guy that got it, but for the most part, I'm, I'm pretty happy and uh, proud of how you know serious everyone's been taking it and um, all the precautions seem to be working pretty well. You know, I think everyone wants to highlight the one or two games that get canceled each week, but hey, 95% are being played and, uh, and it seems to be safe. So, um, you know, I'm taking the positive angle. I'm just lucky that we uh, have a season and for the chance for these kids to compete. Yeah, there have only been a couple games canceled for this weekend. Again, you know, a lot of the focus has been on that LSU-Florida game, which got canceled after a big outbreak for Florida. But you're, you're right. I mean, there have not been many games canceled. There have not been, thankfully, you know, any, if all, you know, many, if any, any at all, kind of serious complications for guys, which has been, which has been great. That's been, you know, I think, I think this has gone better than I think a lot of people expected, which is great. Um, you know, as far as this week's weekend's Alabama-Georgia game, this is one of those really intriguing, you know, irresistible force versus immovable object games where Alabama's offense, which has really not gotten stopped by anyone so far this year, going up against Georgia's defense, which has really not given up a whole heck of a lot this year. How do you see that playing out on the field? Yeah, it's uh, you're right on that. It could be the best strength on strength of the year uh, when you're talking unit versus unit. Alabama's offense, the so last year when Tua went down, uh, it lost a little bit of its element there. They kind of took out the vertical passing game, and Mac Jones was mostly throwing sideline to sideline and letting those All-American and NFL receivers run wild. And, hey, that worked too. But uh, I wanted to see the vertical pass game, and, and here we have it. He's, uh, it's bombs away with Alabama so far. I know against A&M they scored on touchdowns of 87, 77, and 67 seven yards just all you know vertical passing and um you know they lost two guys to the pros but this new guy Mechie is right up there with them so uh it's a great receiver stable they haven't even needed to power uh you know on the ground and I wonder if that's either a weakness or by design so we're going to see if they can really establish a run game against a nasty Georgia defense 
But I think possibly the key to the game, if you say those two strengths maybe net, uh, would be the other side of the ball. When Georgia has the ball against Alabama's defense, um, both have struggled, both have looked good. It's been hot and cold. Uh, with Alabama's defense, they were torched by Ole Miss last week, uh, last Saturday night, and it was crazy to see a track meet with a, a Nick Saban defense. It was 10 straight possessions between the two teams that they scored touchdowns. It's just incredible. So, uh, And then with Georgia's offense, um, you know, it was stuck in the mud in week one. Uh, they, they brought in Stetson Bennett, a former walk-on, who, you know, he's, he's hitting his intermediate passes. The, the the team's rallying behind him. It's a big O line, two five-star running backs uh, with uh, James Cook and Zamir Zeus White. Um, you know, one thing about Bennett I really liked was uh, at the end of the game, uh, the sideline reporter was interviewing him and asking him, "Hey, what's it like to be living out your dream here, a walk-on, uh, your favorite team in Georgia, and in front of all these fans?" And just like a true gamer, a true uh, you know quarterback, right to the X's and O's, he's like, "Well, you know, my third down efficiency, we got to improve on third downs and short yardage." It's like, oh man, <laughs> you know, take a step back and, and let it all in. But now you want that from your quarterback. You want a competitor who's just laser focused and uh, eyes on the prize. So, you know, actually uh, my numbers suggest a Georgia win, and this was before any kind of Saban news or uh, off-the-field distraction with that. And um, My game grader formula had Georgia to win straight up. So, um, you know, I like, I like where it's going this Saturday, and I think it'll be a great game. Yeah, that, that is going to be one that I, I feel like on Selection Sunday in, uh, on December 20th, this feels like a game that's going to get discussed at some point for one or both of those teams as a resume win and a uh, – you know, a quality loss for, for both of them as, as they're each sort of stating their cases for inclusion in the playoff field. The rest of this weekend slate is a little lackluster. The other games involving top 10 teams are all, they're all double digit favorites. Clemson at Georgia tech, Louisville at number four, Notre Dame, number five, North Carolina at Florida state. So let's just skip ahead to next weekend. Uh, next weekend, obviously big 10 back on the field. You know, as you said, we, we talked over the summer before the conference scrapped its season for the first time. Wanted to get kind of an updated look on how you think this Big Ten season could play out. So before you had the Buckeyes pegged as the best team in the league, a college football playoff team, has, has anything changed there in your mind as, as they head into the uh, Big Ten season version 3.0? No, nothing has changed on the Ohio State front. I still think they're the, the class of the conference. Uh, it's, it's a powerhouse program, whatever – uh, you know, phrase you want to use with it. I've used them all, trust me, on the radio across the country uh, the last three months. But this is a program, it's, it's now reloading five stars at most positions. Uh, the only returning Heisman candidate with Justin Fields. And in fact, I just saw that he may have won the, the fastest 40 time of practice, which is really scary to uh, opposing defenses, considering all the, you know, the great talent you have at receiver and corner to think that the quarterback is uh, running the fastest. That's you know, it's dangerous. So uh, incredible offense, incredible offensive line. Um, a couple All-Americans I have in my preseason book, uh, a lot of all Big Ten guys. This receiver stable, yeah, I know it'll, it'll be a little bit young uh, relatively, but you're talking about just stacking five stars and five stars, and we can talk recruiting rankings, but I know that um, certain schools develop and certain don't. But at Ohio State with Brian Harline, a receiver coach, I mean, they really maximize their talent and get the best out of these players. So uh, Trey Sermon in at running back, that was – supposed to be the weakness tom was uh you know oh running back uh there's a hole there well the rich get richer and the oklahoma starting running back transfers in so uh it's a it's a great offense the defense um you know lose some pass rush ability but i, I really like the guys coming up and uh linebackers are veteran and it's dbu so I'm, I'm really set on ohio state to win the conference um real quick i think that you saw them separate from penn state it had been a, a back and forth ohio state penn state uh some of those games in 16 17 and 18 they were close through uh, two of them were penn state huge leads at halftime and in the, in the fourth quarter with ohio state rallies but last year you really saw that gap and i know the score wouldn't suggest it as much because of that goal line fumble by fields and some hero ball by that backup qb but uh i think that the you know that really proved that ohio state's on its own tier well and who is the toughest game on ohio state's schedule this year to you is, is that that week two game at penn state like what's what's the biggest challenge on the schedule for them this year yeah, well, uh, if we talked back in June, I would have definitely said the Penn State game, given that it was supposed to be their whiteout game. Uh, and I've, I've been up to that. I'm a Pennsylvanian, not a Penn Stater, but a Pennsylvanian. And uh, I've seen that environment. It's incredible. I, I think you'd give a team, instead of the usual three home field advantage, I'd give them maybe a six. It's incredible. But, uh, yeah, so that's empty now. It's an empty stadium. That, that negates a huge 
uh, you know, benefit there. Micah Parsons is out there, All-American linebacker and DN. So uh, I, th- I still think Penn State's the toughest test. Um, I would consider Michigan now just because given the rivalry, um, you know, that'll be towards the end of the year with uh, their quarterback a lot of time to develop their new starter. If you caught Michigan early, I think it'd be more, you know, an, an easier matchup, but uh, with that late in the game. And then a wild card could be Indiana. And uh, before the listeners laugh at that, it's it's a team that's quietly pretty solid. I mean, you look at their roster um it was it was a little bit young last year but they performed well it's it's veteran now uh and also a team that's always been close if you look back at some of these scores against the the big uh the big 10 east's big four uh you know michigan michigan state penn state ohio state indiana usually is as a punch away uh from pulling some of these upsets but oh yeah they can't finish the deal so look for them to get one this year i think they're going to beat one of them they'll definitely beat michigan state but maybe another one so uh keep keep an eye on them on the radar yeah, that's actually one that uh, Tony Gerdem and I have talked about on Buckeye Weekly. That this this just feels like this is the year that Indiana gets one of the big three: Penn State, Michigan, Ohio State. I don't know which one it is, but mm-hmm. it, this is just, with as close as they've been and as unpredictable as this year probably is shaping up to be. This just feels like the year they're gonna they're gonna get someone. I don't think they get all three. They might not get two, but it feels like they get one. You know, you mentioned Michigan. They are playing without Ambry Thomas and Nico Collins. That's something that we had we did not know the last time. Those are two pretty big losses. But and you know four new starters on the offensive line, new starter Joe Milton at quarterback. But I mean, you, you mentioned it earlier. Like this is this is a team that is young, unproven in a lot of spots, but probably going to be a lot better towards the end of the year when they face Ohio State than they will be week one, week two. I mean, they, they open at Minnesota. Like they they could very easily lose two or three of those first four games. But by the end of the year, that that could be a little bit more of a a little bit more of an intimidating uh, opponent for the Buckeyes. Yeah, for sure. And I think with Michigan, uh, you know, they lose two star defenders there, but uh, if there's one proven side of the ball, it's got to be defense under Don Brown. Um, Dr. Blitz, uh, he, he's been great wherever he's been. And um, I remember up at Boston College, he, he turned them into the number one scoring defense in the country. And this was, you know, he's not playing with five stars and four star talent up at BC. It's, it was a lot of two star, three star kids from, the, from New England and uh, North Jersey. So to pull that off up there with an, an abysmal offense, not, not helping him out at all with field position or, or clock or anything, that was really impressive. And Harbaugh saw that and plucked him out and brought him out to Ann Arbor. And, you know, it's been great defensive play. It's been, it's been top tier defensive play that is until the final week in November where whatever de- gaudy defensive stats they come into uh, the, the game with Ohio State just <laughs> runs all over them so uh, and throws all over them I mean so it's kind of hard to evaluate this this rivalry in the series because on paper the Michigan defense really is one of the strongest units in the country every year and I expect them to reload every year now uh, but it doesn't really matter against Ohio State who's just out athleting them and out scheming them and outperforming them so uh, but in terms of the, whole, the overall season I, I like their defense offense is the question mark with a young quarterback and four new offensive linemen like you mentioned and not just that but when you look back uh, they had four linemen drafted right that, that's four offensive linemen drafted no, normally that'd be the best in the country you'd think man that team must have averaged seven yards a carry they must have just been mauling opponents not allowing sacks with four NFLers they really didn't perform uh, as you'd expect at the college level um, it was it was average run push below average sack protection uh, so it just doesn't really add up something was happening there so uh, given that I don't know how four new guys will will improve uh, off of four NFLers so I'm pretty worried about, you know, I would, I would look negatively on the offense, positively on the defense, and what that nets out to is probably a third-place finish again in the Big Ten East. And uh, let's take a quick look at the West. You had Wisconsin winning that over the summer. Now Jack Cohn out with a foot injury. I have not seen a timetable more specific than just out indefinitely. And they have a relatively tough first few weeks. And they open a week from tonight against Illinois. That, you know, they should be fine against Illinois. You know, I, I say that confidently, like they didn't just lose to Illinois last year, but <laughs> yeah. they should be fine. They shouldn't overlook Illinois again, is my guess. But after mm-hmm. that, week two at Nebraska, week three host Purdue, week four at Michigan. I mean, those are all losable games. And his backup is a talented but young guy that Ohio State fans should probably remember from uh, recruiting, Graham Mertz. But does, does that Jack Cohn injury change who you think could be representing the West in the Big Ten title game this year? 
Um, you know, not so much. I still think it's Wisconsin's division. It has been for almost the entire time they split the East and West divisions up here. Um, you know, Wisconsin's really strong against their own division and then really can't get it done against the East powers. If you notice, their the record is like 2-9 and nine against the Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan block. So, uh, But against the West, they really dominate. They're able to usually just establish the line of scrimmage and just run all over teams. So, um, yeah, Jack Cohn going down, you lose an experienced starter who won them a lot of games. Um, I don't think that he was really the reason why they, they won the division last year. Uh, and then reports also out of um, spring, but really out of late last season, was that Graham Mertz was right there. Uh, he was right there competing day in and day out with Jack Cohn. So I don't think that there's that big of a drop-off, only an experience level. But in terms of talent, I think it's right there. And, of course, you got you mentioned Mertz was a five-star kid, and it's kind of rare to get at Wisconsin. So um, I like that. You know, the bigger question will be their reload on offensive line and at running back, losing Jonathan Taylor. But, you know, Wisconsin, they basically just have a copy machine. They just keep printing out these 2,000-yard running backs. So I think they'll be fine. Uh, they're more proven, and, and, uh, and their defense is, is really strong, too. Ten starters back from a pretty solid unit. So I, I trust them more than I trust uh, Minnesota. That might have been a one-year wonder. We'll see. I like their offense, obviously, but uh, defensively losing a lot of third-year starters from last year's veteran unit. Um, also won a ton of close games, and you tend to see that reverse year to year. A lot of those were over non-AQ teams up in September. So uh, I trust Wisconsin more than I do the other teams. Um, you know, and, and a couple teams like Nebraska, Purdue, and Northwestern, they were very, very young last year. Look for them, those three to all improve. But even in the case of Nebraska and Purdue, I think they're still a year off. They're still incredibly young. Purdue, I think, has 10 seniors It's uh, and like 75, you know, sophomore and freshmen. It's, it's incredible. So uh, look for those to be 2021 con uh, contenders. Yeah, that's so interesting, those teams with the really, really uh, young rosters this year where – you're going to get another year of eligibility. So those teams in a couple of years could have like really, really, really veteran teams. So that, that's something to uh, keep an eye on for 2021 and beyond. But for this fall, is there like one more Big Ten team that you think is either going to be much better or much worse than most people are expecting this year? Um, yeah, I think with, uh, with Michigan State, I think this is a team It's uh, you know, I launched pick six previews back in 2012 and I think it's pick six previews history. The first time I don't have Michigan State in the top four in the big 10 East, it's been kind of a block, you know, you just put those big four in there, whatever order you want. But I think finally Michigan State falls out of that pack. I think you, you have a transition year there with uh, Mark D'Antonio leaving. Um, and it also was a late hire too. People forget this. This was a March hire. And, uh, and that was right before obviously the shutdowns and there wasn't much spring practice for them. And, and what we've seen on the field so far in this short season has been these coach transition teams have really struggled. Uh, not, not just straight up, but against the spread and it's been noticeable. So and it's not really their fault. When you think about it, they missed out on spring ball for all this install and getting to know the roster and vice versa. Um, so yeah, I think they're going to struggle this year. And it was, it was a program also that when you think of Mark D'Antonio, Antonio's peak years at Michigan State, what they were great at was what? They were great at pass defense. It was the no-fly zone. They were great at taking some two- and three-star talent, developing them, and turning them into NFLers, um, you know, efficient offenses. And when you look at the, the back half of his tenure, all of that went away. They, they struggled against the pass. Uh, they were now recruiting well, getting four and five stars, but then their NFL output actually dropped. It was like the inverse. So this is a program that's kind of going to go through an identity shift, and I don't know what to expect and um, looking a little bit negatively on them. So, yeah, look for them to fall out of the top four. Uh, I do want to give Brett's uh, magazine Pick 6 Previews a plug. It is incredibly detailed and well put together. Lots of really, really informative, easy-to-read graphics. And you can actually get it instantly without even leaving home right now if you want to uh, do a little last-minute cramming before the Big Ten season starts in a week. Brett, uh, first of all, let people know how to get a copy, and then also let them know about a uh, really cool new project that you're launching. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I appreciate that feedback. And uh, I know we're kind of in a unique spot here where uh, half the radio shows I'm on are midseason. I'm talking week six football. And then the other half, it's still preseason. So, yeah, the preseason book is still available. It's uh, pick6previews.com. And you can follow at pick6previews on Twitter. Um, that's the preseason book. And then another project we're launching is, uh, is the helmet store, where you might have seen some tweets where I'm, I'm making custom mini helmets, uh, any high school, any college. I put together some team sets. I did Florida. I did BYU. And they're, they're selling like hotcakes. So, um, you know, and, and um, the, the newest project here is Ohio State. And I'm uh, putting this together. It's eight mini helmets. It's, uh, you know, one has the old Archie Griffin big stickers, the big Buckeye leaves uh, from the 70s. And you have the 
uh, the black helmet with the red decals. You have the uh, the 2012 through 2014 where they had that alternate where they wore the uh, the green leaves and the big stripe and the black face mask. So as you can tell, very detail oriented. Uh, you get some 1960s action in there with the red helmet uh, and the the white one with the numerals. So long story short, uh, just follow at Pick Six Previews. The Ohio State set should be coming out this week. It's uh, eight mini helmets, and um, you know also we do any high school. I've been doing high school helmets all over the country for for parents for teams for booster clubs it's been it's been cool so that's the new project we're working on there well brett thank you very much for joining us uh for pick six previews.com and uh, at pick six previews on twitter you got to spell out six pick s-i-x pick previews.com so uh make sure you follow brett on twitter check out his website uh again highly recommend the magazine really really interesting and informative and uh, worth worth a look if you're looking to do a little last minute cramming before football season starts so brett thank you for joining us um, you can also, uh, this would be a great time to join BuckeyeScoop.com. You can uh, become a member by just going to BuckeyeScoop.com, signing up, get instant access to our incredible team of insiders. We have uh, a four-headed uh, recruiting team of Mark Givler and Bill Green and Alex Gleitman and Mick Walker that just is unmatched anywhere else in the, uh, probably in the country. It is a remarkable team. They develop incredible information. We've had a huge week of information from our ultimate insider, Nevada Buck. Had him on the show yesterday, if you missed that one. Lots of really, really interesting reporting from inside Ohio State practice, which is a place that no one else is really getting right now. So this is, uh, this is a great time to join BuckeyeScoop.com. Yeah, Tom, I just want to echo that, too. From my perspective, I'm covering all 66 Power 5 teams across the country, and uh, I love digging into you know the details at each program. And you guys are top of the list, Buckeye Scoop. Uh, it's a great staff you guys have assembled. It's, it's great work. It's insider scoop. And uh, I suggest, yeah, to all the, the, the followers, follow their whole staff. Keep them at the top of your Twitter feed because um, they're doing great work. And best of luck to your staff and, uh, and obviously Ohio State football this year. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Brett. Really appreciate it. Also, make sure you check out all of our great podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud. Just search Buckeye Scoop to find all of those. You can subscribe right there. Also, please leave us a five-star rating and review while you're at it. Thank you guys for listening. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the football. We will be back with you on Monday for an Ohio State game week. Can you believe it? It is almost here. We will talk to you then.